All right. Well, welcome. I'm Caitlin Rubin, Associate Curator and Director of Programs at the Rose Art Museum. And it is a pleasure to be here tonight with all of you and with the artist Danny Lyon, whose work is currently on view in the museum's galleries, presented as part of our exhibition, Recollections, Six Decades at the Rose Art Museum. First, a few notes. Tonight's program will have closed captioning and you can enable or disable this feature by selecting the closed caption button, which is labeled CC on your screen. Because this is auto generated, I always want to offer fair warning that there will certainly be inaccuracies within this, but we're also recording the program and we'll be correcting the accompanying captions before the video is posted online. I know that many of you have visited us at the Rose over the past months, and I hope that many more will make the trip soon. But because we are gathering virtually here this evening, I also wanna take the opportunity to share with you some images just to start us off of our galleries as they're currently installed and also a selection of the powerful photographs by Danny Lyon in our collection. Tonight's program was made possible through deep collaboration. We are grateful for our partners at Brandeis University, the Fine Arts Department, the Department of African and African American Studies, the Creativity, the Arts and Social Transformation Program, and the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, who have supported this event this evening, as well as the online screening of Lyon's film, SNCC. This screening continues through the weekend, and so if you haven't watched the film already, you're welcome to register through our website for viewing access. We also extend special thanks to Brandeis alumni, Amy and Frank Lindy, in their transformative gifts of the Danny Lyon photographs you see here, as well as their generous support of the Rose's programming, they have amplified and emboldened the dialogues we are able to foster both in and beyond the museum's galleries. We are thrilled to welcome Danny Lyon into conversation this evening. It is notably not the first time that we have gathered as a group to discuss Danny Lyon's work. Although tonight we're fortunate to have Danny with us and also all of you. This program was crafted through multiple meetings with a cohort of students who expressed interest in thinking deeply about Danny Lyon's work and in connecting it to their own artwork and activism today. Along with Peter Kalb, the Cynthia L. and Theodore S. Berenson Associate Professor of Contemporary Art and Chair of the Fine Arts Department at Brandeis University, and Elizabeth Moy, the Rose Art Museum's Programs Coordinator, I was fortunate to take part in these dialogues and to listen and learn from our students. It has been wonderful to work with all 12 members of this cohort, a group that included two students from Waltham High School, as well as undergraduate and graduate students from across the disciplines at Brandeis. Tonight, a number of these students will lead our conversation with Danny using questions developed by the group. We will also save time at the end for some additional questions from all of you, our audience. Um, at the end, we don't have a Q&A box this round because this is a Zoom meeting. We're happy to see all your faces. So at the end, we just ask that you raise your hand if you'd like to ask Danny a question. And now I'm gonna just turn it over to Professor Peter Kalb who will introduce our guest for the evening, the photographer, filmmaker, and documentarian Danny Lyon. Hi, good evening. I am Peter Kalb. Um, and on behalf of the Rose Museum of Art and the Fine Arts Department, it is my great pleasure to introduce and to shortly hand over the mic to Danny Lyon, one of the most significant photographers in US history. Lyon's work epitomizes the risk, beauty, and commitment of documentary photography at its best. And it inspires a sense of activist empathy that invites one to find hope in the past and power in ourselves and each other. As you see or will see in his film, Snick, which will anchor today's conversation, Lyon models the ethics of activist photography, taken in the service of a cause, in dialogue with others, and with an awareness of what photography and film can do to change society. Throughout the decades, Lyon has invested his time, his art, and himself taking photographs of, but more accurately, with a range of communities, including civil rights workers, biker gangs, death row inmates, and Occupy activists. He has been involved and at risk, creating a body of work that provides, as expressed in the title of his recent Whitney Museum of American Art retrospective, a message to the future. And that demonstrates among many things, the centrality of photography and film to activism and social change. 
And finally, Danny Lyon has made some of the most poignant and beautiful photographs, images that profoundly alter lives, minds, and that part of ourselves that is touched by the contrast of a white shirt against a dark ground, an impossibly high horizon line, or a wide southwestern street. His is a work that is very much at home here at Brandeis. And without further ado, I present you our honored guest, Danny Lyon. Oh, hi, Peter. Well, that was very flattering, Peter. I'm looking at myself. I, I, I moved the thing because it shows my books. I love books. And, and yeah, I, I went to school also. And uh, what's happening here? Oh, yeah, here we go. Anyway, you can see my bookcase. So those are all not, mostly history and nonfiction, and I've read all of them. Uh, I went to the University of Chicago, and I studied history. I took some of these photographs when I was 20 years old, the rest when I was 21. I almost didn't graduate because I was so caught up in what was going on. It was so much fun and exciting. Uh, and we, we used to call the school the ivory tower, that meaning the university was basically, you know, it was a kind of never, never land. It didn't really have uh, much to do with reality. So, uh, and especially jumping into what the black community, uh, it was an astounding change for me uh, socially. And I remember arguing, because at that point I was always yelling at people, especially my parents, at a restaurant that I learned more in six months in SNCC, living in a black community than I had learned at the University of Chicago in four years. So I'm glad I went to the University of Chicago. But but I often tell kids when Occupy started, uh, I told the kids just to leave school and join Occupy. But there, it's kind of like two there are two worlds out there, and the other one I call the real world. I love being part of it. I try to still be part of it. Um, am I am I what am I supposed to talk about here, Peter Galb? <laughs> Anything in particular? Elle is going to start this off with some questions, and as the students show up in the uh, in the oh, screen good. opposite you, they'll have they'll have questions. So, Elle, you can you okay. Can go ahead and start up. Let, let me just say I'm delighted to be here. I I I took my son to look at Brandeis many years ago. He he's almost fifty, so this would have been he he went to Brown, which I think was a terrible mistake. He now runs a bar in Brooklyn, so Brown didn't help him that way at all. But, but uh, I I knew who I, you know, I knew Brandeis I re, I kind of remember when it started and later I had a show there in the Rose Art Museum it was a very it was a small show and I got to go there and they printed a little brochure it's nice you have so many prints that's a surprise for me it sounds like some are up on the wall so that's great you know uh, photography is an art so I'm an artist. Uh, that wasn't really recognized when I was 20 and 21. It wasn't considered really an art. And it still isn't in terms of, you know, the art, what they call the art market. You, you know, uh, Frida Kahlo just sold for $34 million, you know. So photography is not, there is a big market and you can make a lot of money if you, if you become a successful artist photography, but, it, but it's still a kind of second rate art form. But I, none of this bothered me. You know, I, 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 thought, I wasn't interested in art. I, I found museums boring and, and photography was, was new and thrilling and I think it still can be. So let's, I, I just want to throw one, I'm still do stuff. I'm very pretty active on the internet. There's a blog I write for called Bleak Beauty as in bleak beauty. And uh, I do a lot on it. I love Instagram, despite the terrible politics and the people who own it, because uh, I get to post photographs and communicate with people. And I, I like writing little captions. So I like Instagram, I do that a lot too. So you're all invited if you can find me. It's just called Danny Lion Photos on Instagram. Okay, Perfect. I'm ready. Perfect, take it away, Ella. Okay, so our first question is, um, you have always immersed yourself within the communities you document, whether while working with SNCC or riding with a biker gang. 
how do you view the importance of relationships in your art? You know, many, many years later, I was credited with inventing something. Uh, I, I, and again, many years later, they said that I was part of the new journalism. And, you know, part of it was natural in the sense that I photograph my friends. That's what Nan Golden does. She's really great and in a way more successful than I am. She photographs her friends. She's crazy, they're crazy, she's queer, they're queer, you know, all of it. And this, her stuff's fabulous. Those are her friends. So uh, it's not the idea of immersion is kind of idiotic because everybody has a world. I think the difference with me was that I was so intense about doing all this that I, I really didn't have a life. I just, uh, whatever I my work was became my life. First, it was a civil rights movement. Later, it was a motorcycle gang. But, but, but they were also subjects in the sense that a painter says, I'm going to paint uh, you know, a certain person, or I'm going to paint flowers. And you go out and sit in the field with flowers. But so even though you know, being in the Chicago Outlaws was my life, and, and I rode around a motorcycle, and I, and I had the vest and the colors, at some point I left, uh, you, you know, uh, and and wanted to move on. And uh, so, because I, it was a subject or when I was done with it, in this case, making a book, I went to my next subject, whatever that was. And uh, I think later when I had a family and actually had a life, it got, you know, I did that less intensely. And, you know, now I, I, I don't have that kind of connection to, to a subject. I, I showed a picture of a boy with a dog. I'll try to make this brief, but, but he, I'd made it years ago and it, it's a very emotional picture. I made it in Knoxville and it's a white kid with a, with a kind of sad little dog. And the whole picture is kind of sad and very emotional. And I showed it, I was at a school and I, I just kind of blurted out, I could never do that again. And I think it's true. So I think I think Peter's right. There's a, a lot of real emotion in in the early pictures, and I'm glad it's there. But whoever did it, you know, I'm I'm just moved on. I'm a grandfather, different person. Thank you, Danny. So our second question is: In what ways did your Jewish upbringing influence your view of the movement and your desire to get involved with SNCC? You know, I did a radio interview recently. The guy looked Jewish and his partner was an African-American black woman. And they kept asking me about being a white person in SNCC. And I found I was, I got really irritated because the whole point about SNCC was it was a beyond racial experience, which it was, you know, but it was, and, and I got, got very annoyed. I've been writing a memoir and I think my background had a lot to do with how my life developed. But I think, you know, that's true of everybody. Everybody has a background. Some people are Irish, some people are Italian, some people, there are all kinds of people. And, and usually the people are proud of where they came from. It, it's simply true of, of all groups of people. And, and what's fabulous about our country and, and is driving the fascist crazy is we have so many different kinds of people in this country. And they are proud of what they are. And, and it, it, it makes it a lot more interesting than Finland or France even. Uh, and that's just the truth about America. And I've spent most of my life after leaving school, leaving my world and, and going into other people's worlds. And it's it's been a great experience. Uh, <clears throat> my mother was born under the czar of Russia and lived through the Russian revolution. And because the town she was in, Bayarusa, Bayer, White Russia, which is in the news now because it's still a communist shithole, uh, was changed hands four times between the whites and the reds. And there were execution dead bodies in the streets. So she's a 10 year old girl. She going to school and the bodies lying there. It was also very cold. My father was a, a German and uh, came from Munich, which is, if you read, uh, you know, about the history of the Third Reich, that was where Hitler came to power and where he came from, where he lived. 
and he used to drink, he was a medical student. He used to drink in this hall and, and Hitler had his private, just like the Chicago Outlaws, the brown shirts, which was the Nazi party, had their own room where they would drink and he, Hitler would walk right by him. He used to tell me, could have killed him with a gun. So he was a refugee because he, he came over to America, you, you know, pretty early in 35, 34. <clears throat> And my mother was a refugee because the, basically the family little by little got out of Russia. And my uncle who delivered me, which isn't done. In other words, her oldest brother became a doctor. The reason he, he uh, left Russia was his buddy murdered a policeman. That's what the Black Panthers were accused of. I mean, he really did it. So he was wanted for first degree murder. And uh, he was... Um, in the Zionist bond. So there was this very political background, especially on the Russian side of the family. And I identified with American Negroes. You know, they were being fucked over and which is exactly what had happened to the Jews in Russia. And so it was easy to identify with a freedom struggle among American blacks, you know. And, and it was, you know, in the film, Dottie Miller, who's also Jewish and she was involved for six years. I was really only part of the movement for two years. She says to me, I was lucky to be there. We were lucky. I was lucky to be there. It was one of the great moments of American history. And I, I was lucky to be there. But in terms of being a student, I got off my ass and went somewhere and did something, uh, you know, less comfortable than smoking pot and watching TV in the basement of the dorm. And it was a good thing I did that, you know, I loved adventure and that was one of the great ones. You're on, Logan. Yes. Hello. Um, in the film, Snake, you showed a clip of a conversation between you and Dottie Zeller, where you made note that you and she, both white, were fortunate to be a part of a Black-led movement. Can you speak to how your identity influenced your role as a storyteller for SNCC, either in separating your experience from others in the movement or facilitating the freedom to take images in the places and scenarios you did? Yeah, that's a double-edged sword. So I'll take the first one. I think you're right, Logan. I think the fact that I was really from the outer world, from another world, I wasn't from Alabama and I wasn't a South. And it, it gave me a kind of distance from what was going on. You know, I saw the South in a kind of romantic way. I have friends from SNCC who they didn't think anything was romantic about it. They wanted to get the hell out of it. I even thought the way people spoke was charming. You know, John Lewis was my roommate. And later in life, we would become very, very close friends. And I, after Obama talked to him and Nancy Pelosi visited him, I had one of the last conversations anyone had with him on the phone. We were very, very close friends. And I think part of the friendship was how different we were and what different worlds we came from. So I think you're right about this first one. As far as the second one, you know, I kind of resented people. I've heard people say, oh, you were a white guy. It was easy to do this. And, and it's true that in terms of SNCC, you, you, you know, uh, I, I could function as a kind of spy because I, I looked like the enemy. And, and at, the, at the very first time I worked with them in Georgia, when I was 20, Foreman said, oh, you, you got a camera, go into the courthouse, take a picture of they had a, you know, a, a big cooler for white people and a little bowl for, for, for black people. And, and they had these signs of, you know, white and colored. He said, go take a picture of that. Well, I was nervous doing it, but at least I was a white guy. Just being a black guy in the courthouse, they would have said, what are you doing here, boy? You know, so I didn't meet anyone and it's what it is. But, you know, I also worked in a prison where basically they made fun of me because I was Jewish, so. You know, I guess it helped. I can't, you know, there's a great Steve Martin film saying, oh, you mean I'm gonna be like this forever? And there's nothing I could do about it. I, I, when I, I was born white, here I am, you know. But SNCC was great. Dottie was right, you know, it was an amazing experience for, for us. And, and, you know, talking about being a storyteller, 
Uh, one of the SNCC people later was the Black Panthers, Mike Thelwell. He was from Jamaica. And he wrote in my book, uh, yeah, he lives in Massachusetts. He taught at Amherst. And, and he, he compared me. In Africa, they have a storyteller. I forgot it's called, I forgot the name. Not the oral Google, griot. An oral griot. The griot, yeah. He wrote in my book, you're, you're, the, you're the griot. And it just made me feel wonderful because I was doing my thing and, and Mike you know, thanked me for it. So. <laughs> Hi. Um, what story? Hi, Hi. How's it going? Um, what people's stories and life were were you able to capture on camera, but still were not able to tell to the full extent that you wanted to? Well, I don't know. You know, I'm a kind of a nutbag. I, I don't, I'm not very organized when I. These things kind of evolve, you know, even with SNCC, I, I had a motorcycle, I wanted to ride around my motorcycle. I, I wasn't said, okay, I'm now going to be the great SNCC photographer. But once I got involved, I, you know, it was an amazing experience. And so I did that, but then I went on and did other things. Uh, they're kind of organic. I, I, you know, I don't wash out and say, well, you know, now I'm going to make a document about the people who sweep the streets in Cambridge Square every morning at five in the morning. You know, sometimes I'll see something and I'll say, oh, wow. And, and I'll go back to it. Uh, you know, there are a lot of homeless here in Albuquerque. And, and I remember just on a Sunday passing, well, every time I went into town, I'd pass this park and there'd be like a hundred people living there. And then uh, recently I thought, well, you know, I went there and, you know, I got to talk to people. Occupy was a really interesting experience. And I didn't spend months with Occupy. I, I happened to be in, in Manhattan when Zuccotti Park was active. So I photographed that. And then because I could afford to move around the country, I, I went to LA, uh, Oakland, uh, a couple other places to photograph it. Uh, but it was an interesting experience because about a third of the people in the camps were homeless. And I had never really talked to homeless. You know, we try to avoid homeless people. They're dirty and smelly, and you're afraid of them, and you maybe they're crazy, and you, you don't hang out with them really. The homeless guy sits next to you in the subway, you get up and move, you know. Only this time they were there, and I got to talk to them. It was a very interesting experience. I, I think that was one of the great things that Occupy did was to humanize homeless people and, and you know, bring them out of the dark and and all of all of it. And even though, you know, Occupy's been criticized and denigrated. Their term, the one percenters, or the 0.001 percenters, is now mainstream politics. When they talk about, you know, taxing the rich, that's where it comes from. And it's a real deal, you know. I love Dr. Boy. I thought it was fabulous. <clears throat> I'm Vincente. Come Hi. Está, amigo? Uh, muy bien, usted. <laughs> oh. I got you there, but uh, thank you. You're fabulous. You know, you only mean you got me. Come on. You're fabulous. Who don't they de Mexico? Fabulous de Casas, muy bonitos. Puro Adobe. Oh, isn't that nice? Yeah, that's really nice. I love the wood on the ceiling. Um, it's fascinating yeah, to hear yeah. about your background. Um, so after watching your film, I wanted to ask you more about how you merge photography and video together. And if you, you could tell us more about moving between these art forms and whether you're able to accomplish something in one that it's more difficult in the other medium. That's actually a very good question, Vincente. You know, so I begin as a photographer and I'm a, I'm a kind of, I'm a natural, you know, and I think photography is a gift. There's some people who, you know, my, my my father took pictures. He was really good at them. My uncle took pictures and, and, and it was terrible. And my father would make fun of my uncle when he'd show the pictures. So I, I think it has, it's just a gift. You know, some people are great in, in, at seeing light and visually very strong and they can be, you know, moronic when it comes to music and other things. I can't spell at all. A lot of things I don't do right. I'm, I'm not even a terrible athlete. I'm a non-event and I'm a bad mechanic, but I had a gift. And so I was good right away. 
And, and when I was young, and this would be, you know, in the 60s, you know, I knew artists who were painters and sculptors. And they affected me a lot because I saw how dedicated they were to what they did. You know, they didn't com do commercial work. All the photographers I knew did commercial jobs. They were in Magnum, they worked for advertising, they did all kinds of things. And I said, well, that's not being an artist. An artist doesn't do that. He does his thing and he starves and that's the way it is. But, but filmmaking was considered then the Cadillac of the art forms, meaning it was so expensive to make films. And I'm just talking about 16 millimeter films. And this is when, you know, Robert Frank had made a few films, no one looked at. Kenneth Anger's made films, people adored Kenneth Anger. And, but, but that just, you know, it was very expensive. So I aspired to that. And then finally, uh, I, I made my first film in the tattoo parlor. But starting in the seventies, I mostly made films, what's called analog. These are Niagara 16 millimeter. And they were pretty much a big flop. I mean, I, I never made any money from them. And, you know, they were never really circulated or shown. But they're good films. And, and you know, I'm about to have a, a big show here in New Mexico and central to it will be a film. And that happened at the Whitney, which I think Peter saw, but, but they built a theater in the middle of a photo show and, and showed this film. Like, you know, it was 80 minutes long. And the curators argued, and one of them was British, who was really the most active curator. And he said to Elizabeth Sussman, you can't show you if you show a movie in a gallery you got to be 10 minutes long you got to keep people moving and she said no i want to show this film because it's central to his life and it was 83 minutes long and that was really thrilling for me movies are very very powerful would you, you know, say we're that... in a new age go ahead oh, would you say that this gave you like an opportunity to give people a platform to tell their stories themselves and you kind of being a mediator you know, I'm much more cold-blooded than that, Vincent. In other words, I'm not really a good guy. I'm an artist. You know, artists are very egocentric and self-centered. They, they think they're God, they're creating the universe. That's why what they do is so compelling. So I, I see these people as subjects. And when I made a film about this guy, Willie, who I adored, he was crazy, Willie. You know, he had mental problems. He died in jail. And, but, you know, when I'm recording him and filming him, when Willie says something really stupid, I edit it out because I see Willie as better than he sees himself. You know, I see the God inside Willie, and that's what I want to show to people. So I don't really see it as, you know, here I am as neutral observer. I don't feel that at all. I, I also think there's no such thing as a neutral observer. None of us are neutral. We're all humans and have feelings. I think one of the great crimes of, of the media is the idea that an objective media really even exists because it doesn't exist. You, you know, I, I, you know, we would, I always, always hated Walter Cronkite. And, you know, that they would come across as like, somehow we're above this and, but, but how can you, I mean, a building would blow up and there are all these dead bodies. Aren't you supposed to cry and scream and which they should do if they're human. And uh, I think the media has done a lot of harm to this country, you know, in terms of getting us some wars that were really very unpopular, just voicing, you know, big power opinions, you know. It's very kind of sad. I mean, we're in unbelievable trouble now. So what do you do? I mean, one thing is to, you, you have your own conscience. You want to be a good person. You want to self, have self-respect. So what, what do you do? You, you know, We're like in a situation of the 10 years before the American Civil War. What do you do? You know, Do you pay your taxes? Uh, Thoreau said, no, I'm not going to pay my taxes because there's an ugly war. And they put him in jail and someone bonded him out. That was the War of 18, the invasion of Mexico. He was the first person to do that. And John Brown said, no, this is really crazy. I'm going to start the Civil War. I'm going to start a slave uprising. And he killed about five people. He dragged them out of their houses and cut their throats. And, you know, he was considered either a lunatic or later a saint. And, and when the war started, uh, 
soldiers marched to war singing about John Brown, who tried to start it 10 years earlier. Now we got climate change. I mean, I just read a book I'm crazy about called How to Blow Up a Pipeline. I think it's time for people to blow up pipelines. A, a lot of people don't understand why young people are so quiet about a disaster that's going to affect them much more than someone my age. Thank you. That was uh, very interesting. Hi, Eileen. Hi. Um, so now Hi. switching gears a little bit, I am interested in asking you about where do you situate your work between the realms of journalism and the realm of art? I, you know, they're categories. I think when I began, I loved the idea of journalism. I had a press card and I, and I love journalists. Uh, you know, uh, there, there are some great people do a really dangerous job. They get arrested, they get killed. They got all kinds of horrible things happen to them. I think it's an incredibly honorable uh, profession. It's also vanishing, as you know, uh, people don't buy newspapers, you know, because Facebook steals all the news or Apple just steals the news and reprocesses it. Um, the people who actually do the work don't, they're very, they're less and less true. I think journalism is mar marvelous. You know, the, the art question is interesting because inside SNCC, I, I tended to do my own thing. I wouldn't listen to anyone. We made a poster and I'd like being there. So I, I guess it was just natural. I think now that I'm nearing the end of my life, I, I am an artist. I think I know when I was a little boy, I wanted to be an artist in a romantic sense, but I entered a field that wasn't completely kosher as an art form, which is photography. So. I think, you know, when you talk about news reporting, most of it goes in the garbage, but some of it is elevated, the writings are elevated to, to art. And, and so I, I think that's what they call a personal choice. I think if, if you have it in you to be an artist, you should stick, it, stick to your guns and, and be one. Uh, you know, I'm reading about Stephen Crane who was starving, he was dead by 29. He, he wrote an incredible story about Maggie, who was a prostitute. No one would buy it. He printed it himself. And then he wrote the Red Badge of Courage, and then, and no one, and then he died. And it's considered one of the greatest things ever done in American literature. Hi, Pilar from New Mexico. Come on, stop. Ah, bien. So this is coming from uh, an undergrad studying art. So one of your earliest exhibitions was in a dorm at the University of Chicago. So what was your experience with photography and art making as a student? And how does that work that you made when you're a student relate to your later photographs and films? You know, so I studied history, but it is a red lord gym and I, I got a little lessons in how do you make a great painting? And Hume one is a great course. And then I read Thucydides. I loved all this stuff. But but having taken these pictures in the South, I came back to the North and it was like news and it kind of, it made me a local hero, by the way. And, and I put them up in the dorm and all this stuff. But, but I was, you know, it was political and I was showing something. It would be like you would go to Rwanda and, and photograph, not Rwanda, but, who are these people being screwed over in Myanmar? Now, there's a whole group of people that have been persecuting and really gorgeous looking people. Anyway, you would go to, and come back with these pictures and you'd be all excited and want to show everybody. You know, on the other hand, I was really just beginning. I wasn't a very good photographer. And I always thought that work was, they use the word juvenilia. If you look at Mozart, there's something wrote when he was six years old or eight years old. And, and Stephen Crane wrote poems. He was smoking at six and he was writing poetry at six. And, uh, you know, it's not really junk, but it's, it's very early work. And, and that's how I felt about the civil rights work. I, I really only thought I'd taken one good picture. And then I went on and I got better. I did the bike riders. But, um, you know, I think because historically it was such an important subject that the pictures have had a life of their, of their own. And uh, I, I, I got to make 
nice looking pictures at a very important moment in our history. You know, not just black history, but history period. And it, interestingly, that moment, this nonviolent moment in, in, in the nonviolent movement, it had repercussions around the whole world. Speaking about Chile, I have a book out called The Tupamaros, which was a guerrilla movement in Uruguay. And I was stunned that they were singing, We Shall Overcome That in 1964. And when Nelson Mandela was arrested and, and imprisoned for the beginning of his 26 years in prison, that was at the same moment that SNCC was happening. So people were watching this. I mean, imagine you know being in Africa and because what was happening in America was global news. So it was really re remarkable moment. And I was an American, I had a camera, so I got to be there. I'm glad the pictures survived. You know, the whole point was uh, I just turned into an old man, but pictures are forever. So it's great to hang in there. And I think it's part, part of the power. You know, when you're in a room and you say, oh my God, this is amazing. Or there's Martin Luther King saying, or better yet, there's John Lewis and he's in bed and he's dying and you have a movie camera. It's like, oh my God. And it's part of the power of what you're recording is this feeling that this is remarkable and you want to preserve it and you want other people to experience it and you want it to live on forever <laughs> okay go ahead Logan. <laughs> thank you um today everyone has a camera in their pocket and the instant share of social media has led to an unprecedented pre unprecedented prolification of photographs we are indoctrinated with images of violence and some argue that we as a society have become desensitized to them have you been desensitized to disturbing photos on the internet in today's context do you view your earlier photos of police brutality and anti-black violence in a different light well that's about four different questions so i'll skip the last one the answer to that's no. I mean, what I do is for eternity and it's it's fixed, you know, it's fine. It's not changed because of this other shit. Um, everybody has a camera. That's interesting. I think what's wrong with everyone has a camera is, and I, you know, I'm interested, you know, I have these followers on Instagram. I don't follow anybody, but I look at people like Logan, if you hook up to Instagram, I'll, I'll check you out and see if you know what you're doing, but, but that's what I do. I start and I look at it and some of them are very good photographers and a lot of them are just really inane. So, so I think despite the fact that we all have cameras all the time, I think the artists will come out. You know, some people care about what they're doing. They edit things. You know, I've, I have two sons who are artists and one of them went to Cooper Union and, and when he had a, a little flip phone and he, he we, we, we burned garbage in the backyard and he burned, he, he said, oh, dad, I made a film, you know, but he didn't make a film. All he did was take two or three movie shots, you know. Making a film is complicated. You have to edit it and narrate it or you do whatever you want. So it, it, it's interesting in a way, in a way it makes what I, I don't know that today if I would reappear as a 20 year old I have no idea what I do. Yeah, I guess I'd try to be, I was gonna say, I, I guess I would try to be a master of the universe, but I meant, I was gonna say, I, I think I'd try to be a master of the internet. I mean, there would be a challenge to use the internet as art, you know? The difference between art and, and all this other garbage is often just editing, you know? You know, people show me pictures and they're like a hundred pictures and they should reduce them to five and then, They'd be interesting to look at. Did that answer the question? Yeah, it was a couple of questions. Yes, I think I'm gonna focus in on one question. So, okay, so for okay, so have you personally been desensitized to a lot of the disturbing photos on the internet? Him, oh, right. The murder of George. You know that, that's a right. Well, that's a that is an interesting question. So uh, I'll jump to the second one. A young girl, I think she was a teenager, had enormous guts to make that film. 
Policemen do not like to be photographed. Policemen do not like you to be near them. Policemen do not like to, for you to be behind them. And policemen carry guns and mace and clubs and electronic shit and can, they can kill you. And I know this because I've spent my whole life photographing policemen. Uh, she took a lot of guts to do that. She didn't go away. She later said she felt terrible that she didn't grab the guy's arm. Look what she did. And, and I know nothing, nothing about her skills or anything, but look what she accomplished through sheer bravery, really, in, in the face of fascism and violence. The other thing is true, and I, I think, you know, photography is a mechanic art. And I think it's, it's been, had a dehumanizing quality on mankind since it was invented. It's a machine. And machines have no feelings. A lot of people have no feelings, turns out. But, you know, ro robots are replacing people. And, and uh, so I, I think it was a struggle for me, but it was very intentionalized to humanize my work and, and put a lot of feeling in it. That was intentional. And, and the reason was I felt the camera itself was dehumanizing. That has nothing to do with, you know, seeing uh, dead bodies. Well, thank you, Danny, for all these questions. We have one more from our students and then we're gonna open it up um, to the audience. Uh, so for you to raise your hands when you're ready to ask Danny a question, but Rin for our final question. Thank you for coming to speak with us today, Danny. Um, this is the final question. Um, so near the end of your documentary, SNCC, Congressman John Lewis tells you that the next wave of activists is coming that they're on their way. Some of them are probably here tonight, activists and photographers alike. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, go out and do something. I mean, you're not gonna do it in school. I mean, that's why I left school. You know, I was supposed to go to graduate school. I was supposed to be a lawyer. I, I walked away from all of that. And, and then you have to deal with the question of economic security. Um, I didn't care about economic security. I thought I'm in America, I'm not gonna starve to death. I just walked away from it. And in the end, it worked out really well for me, but I'm still alive and it's 50 years later. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, the big boogaboo now is climate change. W what are you gonna do about it? I think the movement, you know, there have been three different waves of activism against climate change. I did a book called Burn Zone about eight years ago about climate change. I mean, I published it myself, and but it's also been, I, I did a new book called American Blood, which I encourage you to get. I think we, we sell some on PayPal, but, but Karma is the publisher. And it's 50 years of essays with photographs going back to when the first thing I wrote, I wrote when I was a student, it's about capital punishment. So that's the kind of stuff hopefully you're writing now, but it's readable, you know, it's not that bad. And, um, but all the burn zone appears in this book. There've been three waves of activism around climate. And the first one was very violent and people went to prison one guy I really admired was a University of Chicago student like yourself. And he went to LA and got involved with some guys and they went to a parking lot, a General Motors dealers. He had all these Hummers in the parking lot and they pay, spray painted them and stuff like they just vandalized them. He went to prison for three years, prison for painting on a fucking car. But at least he had the guts to do it. And now, it, it's been a terrible failure, the anti the climate movement. And there's a new book you should buy. It's called How to Blow Up a Pipeline. The only dis disappointment is he doesn't actually tell you how to blow up a pipeline, but basically argues that that uh, nonviolence is playing into the hands of the enemy and the movement has to get violent against material things. I totally support that. I'd, I'd love to help you blow up a building. I, I mean this in... in, in in all sincerity, you know, I don't have to tell you what the danger is, 
but but you know it's just like john brown you know people thought he was crazy but he wasn't crazy and he sparked a war that had to happen i'm i'm a pacifist i'm against war but the civil war was justified you know and it and it freed the slaves and slaves had been trying to free themselves for centuries so yeah i i think the the climate movement is where it's at and I think it has to get nasty. And I think there are endless objects out there that, that are the uh, legitimate targets. He stresses that you shouldn't hurt anybody because you shouldn't. And it'll just turn everyone against you. And you don't want to kill anyone. You don't, you don't want to go to jail for a life sentence. You know, these guys begin by just scratching all the SUVs in Stockholm and everybody starts bu bu stops buying SUVs. Yeah, I, I believe in activism, but but you know I'm an artist. I I'm comfortable. I have a dog. You know, happy happy marriage at Apple Orchard, and um, I'm glad I've been in jail a few times. But uh, I, I feel I can be more influential by writing, uh, making films, than I can by you know blowing up a gas station. Although I think that's a great idea. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Danny, for the hour that you spent with us. And thank you also to all of our students. It's been wonderful to work with you over the, the past few weeks to develop this program together. Um, thank you also to everyone who attended tonight. It's been a pleasure to see your faces and to hear your questions. Um, I hope that we'll continue to see oh. you at the museum. And also, I just want to send a reminder out that you can still view Danny's film, SNCC, um, which is streaming through the ROSES website. You can sign up and continue to watch it at your leisure whenever works for you um, through Sunday. So Danny, many, many thanks from all of us here at the ROSE.